So thanks again for joining us for another uh, competitive advantage talk here at the 2020 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. The competitive advantage talks are brought to you by the Craft Analytics Group. My name is Matt Cabrera. I'm a second year MBA student at MIT, and it's my pleasure to introduce our presentation, uh, Storytelling Lessons Learned from the Bullet Man and Sue Bird. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Shira Springer, from uh, a sports and society reporter at WBUR to the stage. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Now, I'm sure some of you might be wondering what exactly does a sports and society reporter for public radio do? Well, I'm in the storytelling business, and my job is to find great stories, hopefully great stories, and figure out a way to tell them that's compelling and engaging and captures the attention of local and national audiences. But to do that, we have to use data a little differently. So the focus of this talk is to explain how public radio uses data differently, what data holds value and what data doesn't, and why. So to start out with, I wanted to give a little bit of industry context, big picture here. I think we all know that the way we consume sports has dramatically changed over the last decade or two, and with that, so has sports journalism. I don't need to tell you this, but data-driven stories are everywhere. So are narrative stories. They're gaining in popularity all the time. I think that's in part due to the popularity of podcasts and documentary series like 30 for 30. I also think that there, everything is fair game when you're doing narrative stories. There's a lot of territory out there. And when you have such a crowded media landscape, you can find different stories to tell and media outlets can really develop a distinctive brand through storytelling. Okay, so you know I'm in the storytelling segment here, the narrative storytelling segment, and I'll admit I personally have a love-hate relationship with data. I don't know if I should say that so loudly here. Um, <laughs> but I know I need the numbers. I've been a participant in this conference. This is my 14th year, and I know there's value in the data. But I also see storytelling as a craft, as an art form. And there's a part of me that doesn't want the numbers interfering with the art. Um, so the way I look at data is I'm not data-driven, but I'm data-influenced. So the goal here is to show you how data influences my work throughout the storytelling process, from how I find stories, to how I tell stories, to how I measure the success of stories. And here come some numbers for you. And one of the, num the numbers that I really wanted to draw your attention to are the podcast numbers. Because one, it shows you that NPR is pretty darn good at telling stories, number one podcast publisher in the US. Um, and also it shows you that there's quite a large audience for that kind of storytelling. Now, how does this influence my work? Well, I will tell you at the station, we talk constantly about our stories and doing them in podcast style. What does that mean? Well, it often means making them very immersive. Um, it could be the way we set up a scene. It could be embedding music in a story. Those are two very simple um, options of how we make it podcast style. But what's interesting to me is we talk about making it podcast style as if it's something new, but it actually reflects the storytelling objectives of NPR that have been long held objectives of NPR. And, and those storytelling objectives are number one, create driveway moments. So in case you're not familiar, driveway moments are those moments when Maybe you're coming home from a long day of work and you put on public radio and you start to hear a story, you pull into your driveway, the story's still going and you sit there, parked, listening for the story to finish. That's the ultimate goal. We want to hook listeners and have them keep coming back again and again. And how do we do that? By being immersive and intimate and impactful. What's immersive? We spend a lot of time figuring out how to bring listeners into the scene. All of those door knocks you hear, or doors opening, or those phones ringing, or those candid conversations you hear in the background, that's all part of creating an atmosphere in the story that really draws in listeners. And also, we have the benefit of using the human voice 
a lot in our audio stories. And there is, for my money at least, nothing more intimate than the human voice. And then distinctive narratives. It's as simple as this, and we say this all the time at this station, zig when others zag. It's sort of a little bit of our motto um, at public radio. So from there, I thought you'd have fun with this. This is another way in a sort of a big scale that data influences the work that I do in storytelling work. This is the morning edition clock, actually, the new morning edition clock. And this was heavily influenced by data. And I'm sure you're now wondering, well, how? Um, the data was unstructured data, textual data. Um, it was listener complaints. So the old style clock basically felt choppy to listeners. They thought it was distracting. They thought there were too many promotions embedded in the clock. And so NPR decided they were going to redesign it, and they redesigned it specifically for deeper dives into stories, for those driveway moments that NPR knows is its brand. So I thought that's interesting. Now, we go from, we've done the industry level, we've done the NPR level, and now we're going to get into the nitty gritty and the story level. I think you're all probably familiar of the, with the two ways that we use numbers um, in storytelling. First, they're the numbers you put in stories, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the numbers we use to measure the success of stories. Um, we'll get to that in a moment. But I came from the Boston Globe, 19 years as a sports reporter there, where I would say we're, we were a pretty data-driven organization by the end of my time there. Obviously, we liked a lot of numbers in our stories um, when appropriate. And when I arrived at uh, public radio at WBUR here in Boston, one of the first lessons I learned was less is more. And it, and it came through this story I did on Rich Hill um, when he was pitching with the Dodgers. We brought him into the studio for an interview. And um, it's going to be a story about the ups and downs in his career. He had just signed his big contract with the Dodgers. It was also going to be about the loss of his infant son. And we're putting the story together. And a producer says to me, um, do you, do you really think we need his ERA in this story? And I was just about floored. Um, but it goes to show you the kind of thinking with radio storytelling, which is they really want to pull back on the numbers. Um, we did put the ERA in the story, rest assured. Um, and the other thing that we talk a lot about when we're dealing with numbers in the radio world and in audio storytelling is, can you make numbers visual? A good example of this is very simple, almost cliche example is if you're dealing with volume, how many pools does it fill? Big volume. If you're dealing with length, how many football fields? Um, and then another lesson that I learned at public radio was beware of too many voices. This is a little bit of a, a quirky numbers lesson, but too many voices are a problem. They overwhelm the human ear. So one voice, okay. Two voices. Uh, okay, three voices getting a little risky and four voices, most editors will say enough, no more than four voices in a, a four to eight minute story. So that's a little bit of the NPR world and numbers. Okay, now the numbers that measure success. Two questions usually hang over journalists. What will audiences want? Why will audiences care? And in the what will audiences want category, and I'm using this term volume of attention metrics. It's sort of my mashup of volume metrics and attention metrics. It's basically the numbers you use to measure interest. Now, here's a question for you. I'm going to toss it out to you. If we're in Boston, and if we only did feature stories on the player in the Boston area who rated the highest when it came to volume metrics and attention metrics, who do you think would be the focus of all of our stories? Did I hear a Tom Brady there? You didn't even give me a chance to get a sip of my water. Um, yeah, Tom Brady. And Tom Brady would probably be number one, number two, and number three. <laughs> and so I was thinking, well, what's the only thing that could top Tom Brady? And I looked at the metrics, and I'm like, OK. And it turns out it's this, Tom Brady and a puppy. <laughs> because animals and Tom Brady rate incredibly high. Now, on the other side of the equation, you have instinct and experience. 
And oftentimes people see that as a big question mark. It, it's, it can be very subjective. I look at it as you know it when you see it. And in my radio career so far, there hasn't been a story that's been a better example of you know it when you see it than the bullet man. And that's where, gonna, where we're gonna go next. So, this is the story of Dennis Rainier. And in 1978, Dennis was running the Grand Valley Marathon. And around mile 10, something hit him in the head. He wasn't quite sure what it was. He thought it might be a rock, um, maybe part of a brick. He was just absolutely puzzled by what it could be. Um, he put his hand up to his head and he started feeling around. There was this huge goose egg on the top of his head, but he decided to keep running even though it was a struggle. And I'm actually gonna let Dennis tell the story from here. You can play that uh, bullet man clip. I was losing about 15, 20 seconds a mile. And I was getting frustrated. Further on I got, uh, the more wobbly uh, I got. I had a little trouble focusing my eyes. Again, I was trying to rationalize what, what in the world happened here. Dennis slowed to a walk around the 20 mile mark. It was only to see if it would clear my head and uh, give me some uh, better focus. But never did the thought occur to me, well, I better sit or quit or take a ride or bail. Uh, that never even occurred to me, actually. And why was that? Why didn't that occur to you? Well, it was either stupidity or dedication. You can take your pick. Probably stupidity more than anything. <laughs> so you get a good sense of what happened and also a good sense of Dennis from that clip. Now, Dennis finishes the marathon in 3.09, and he's pretty disappointed. His wife comes up to him. He had expected to run under three hours. And she says, what happened? I thought you were going to run much faster. And he says, I don't know. Something hit me in the head at mile 10. And his wife says, you know, you might want to go to the race doctor and get that checked out. So reluctantly, Dennis goes to the race doctor and gets it checked out. And the, the race doctor starts poking and prodding around in the top of his head. And he says, I think you've been shot. And he says, I see something silver and shiny embedded in your skull. You should go to the hospital. So Dennis and his wife drive to the hospital, and that's where that x-ray was taken. And lo and behold, Dennis had been shot in the head at some point during the race around the 10-mile mark. They get the bullet removed at the hospital. It becomes a police investigation. And there are two theories about what happened. At least the police have one theory, and Dennis has another. So the police think that it was you know, an errant bullet from a hunter, a nearby, you know, a hunter who was near the race course. The race course did run through some rural countryside. Um, Dennis, however, a couple days after news broke about what happened to him, received a call. It was a mysterious caller. And this caller tells him, you know, I was running about your pace at the 10 mile mark and I have some people out to get me. And I think you may have gotten a bullet that was intended for me. So that completely freaked out Dennis, but nobody ever solved the case. It's an, it's an open case to this day. I, I talked to the sheriff's officer who worked on it, uh, but you're all probably wondering now, okay, great story. What does this have to do with how data influences storytelling? Well, here's how. We're going back to what do audiences want? And if you look at some numbers, these are just some very simple numbers. If you look up how many pod, the most popular podcasts you see that 16 of the 25, true crime and mystery. Meanwhile, not so much interest in marathon or running in the podcast world. Okay, great. So when I'm doing this story, it's a 10 minute story, how do I wanna structure it? Well, it's not like I consulted the podcast charts, but if you're working in public radio, you know what's popular in the audio storytelling world. And I was like, okay, this is not a marathon story. This is a true crime story. So it's a 10 minute story. Seven minutes are focused on the mystery and the true crime elements of what happened to Dennis. 
And so one way of thinking about the way that data influences storytelling is it points you in a promising direction. It doesn't tell me how to write the story or really how to structure the story, but it says, ha, you might want to head in this, this way. Also, I should have, you know, interest of full disclosure here, I'm a marathoner. My personal bias was, and, and believe me, I asked Dennis about the marathon for about 30 minutes in our interview. I wanted every little detail. So my personal bias was, oh, I want lots of marathon details. But I knew, <laughs> given the data, eh, probably not the wisest way to go. All right, so this is a great example of little known athlete, little known story. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what happens when you have a well-known athlete. An athlete, quite frankly, who's overcovered. And that brings us to Pedro Martinez. So Pedro came into the studio for an interview. This was during the 2018 season. And talk about overcovered. I don't know if he declined any inter interview requests uh, that summer. And so there was a lot of material out there. And of course, we wanted to do something different and be distinctive. So again, going back to that unstructured data approach, that textual data, I looked up what had been written. I watched interviews. And I saw he talked a lot about the 2018 Red Sox, a lot about Alex Cora, a lot about Chris Sale, a lot about what it was like to pitch in the World Series. And I thought, OK, well-covered topics. Then I met with a few baseball fans at the station, and we just started bouncing around ideas. And silly things came up, like, I wonder if he likes it when the crowd sings Sweet Caroline. And so I started, you know, I started going through my head and I'm thinking, all right, music, Pedro, I wonder what kind of music he'd like. I, I don't see anybody asking him in these interviews about his musical tastes. So it led to this moment in my interview with Pedro. If you had a walk-on song today, what would it be? El Cantante. Can you sing that for us? Yo. Soy el cantante que hoy han venido a escuchar lo mejor del repertorio a ustedes voy a brindar. And can you translate? Y you know what that, that song means? That I'm, I'm, I'm the artist that you pay to, to come and see, perform, and that I'm gonna actually show you the best of me and the best of my repertoire uh, at the time I come out. And there's no time for sadness. There's no time for, you know, anything else but to perform. So that's a side of Pedro you re rarely get to see. And, and I think you can say that the data influenced the direction of that interview in a very subtle way. So what about athletes that probably should be better known, who are undercovered, but pro-level athletes? And that brings us to the other person in the title of this talk, Sue Bird. And one of the statistics you may be familiar with about women's sports coverage is that only 4% of sports media coverage in the US is devoted to women's sports. And it was a subject I talked to Sue Bird about in an interview, and basically, you know, she said, we don't get our stories told, it affects the interest in our game, it also leads to a lot of misconception. And it ties into this talk because what stood out to me, or what stands out to me, is when you're telling stories, when you're looking for stories, you not only have to use data differently, you have to think about data differently. And part of thinking about data differently is thinking about what's not there, what's not covered, and the, the, maybe the statistics you don't see. So brings up an important point. Think about numbers differently. Remember what's not there matters. In addition to stories that aren't covered or areas that aren't covered, I'll give you a, a statistical example. Let's say you have a city that was an athletic powerhouse and produced tons of pro athletes year after year after year after year. And then suddenly there's a fall off. They're no longer producing pro athletes. It just drops off and, it, and it, there's a drought for years. Well, if I'm seeing those numbers, it makes me question what happened in that city. And I'll bet you, if you go behind those numbers, you will find 
a great story there. It might be a great story at the intersection of sports and culture or sports and politics or sports and business, but there's something there in the absence of those numbers, and I think that's important to remember. Um, also tied in with that is sports and society stories in particular, stories at the intersection of sports and society, are there oftentimes to create interest rather than reflect it. And that leads to different measures of success. And that's a, you know, the measure of impact. Again, a couple simple examples. If you're doing a story about, let's say, a, a youth football player, right? And it's a concussion story and you follow him through concussion rehab and he keeps you know, suffering from headaches and sensitivity to light and you really just document this kid's struggle. Well, part of it is, yeah, you want people to read about this kid, but another measure of the success of that story is if it has an impact. Do the rules change? Do the medical protocols at his school change or in his league change? So think about ways to measure success differently. That's just one way. Um, and there, there are lots of examples that you can, you can think of where you're, you're measuring success differently. Another one, um, an underfunded inner city league, you profile that. Well, when the story comes out, does the funding change for that league? Again, thinking about impact as a measure of success. All right, this is the portion of the talk where I give you some storytelling tips, I hope, um, tips. And um, I like to say it's the please do try this at home portion. Um, first off, you know, what I've been talking about all along, which is this immersive quality, you want to bring audiences along for the ride. So you should look for topics or issues or access that allows you to bring audiences along for the ride. Again, I know we're often talking about data being data-driven stories, but sometimes it's good to let the number support the narrative, not vice versa. And then um, the bottom two are, I think are the most important. You wanna seek out the unexpected, the anomalies, things that are a bit mysterious um, about the numbers because behind that you will find great stories. And then finally, this is a big one for me, try to figure out why the audience will care. Because if you can tap into why the audience cares, if you can tap into an emotional connection to your story, then that's going to help you create something that's compelling and engaging and really connects. And with that, I will take some questions. Questions? I can't see you because the lights are so bright, but yes. I don't know if there's a microphone or not. Great. Star before, mostly at the Indianapolis Star before I moved Bob into- Bob Kravitz country, right? I know Bob pretty well, actually. <laughs> yeah, that is, but he's now at the Athletics, so he's moved on as well. Um, and I, I left a few years ago and now in, in, in communications for a labor union, but I don't know if this is related to sports, but I really was struck by your listing of the most popular podcast and the storytelling. And one thing, I've become a podcast freak that I've kind of found very cool about it. There's still, uh, uh, there seems to be an appetite for hard news or, uh, or in-depth stories, whether they're sports related or not. For instance, the New York Times is, uh, the, Daily. the Daily is almost number one every day, and I listen to it all the time and stuff. Have you found that to be the case, that there's a, uh, there's, there's a chance to be a little more serious and more of a platform to tell your story maybe in a little more serious way than, than in the past? Yes, I think the other nine, or maybe seven of the, of the nine that weren't too true crime were the daily Up First, NPR's news podcast, other sort of where they talk about issues, and then there were a couple of comedy um, podcasts thrown in. So the question is, are there opportunities to be a little more serious? Um, well, I think some of the stories, I mean, yes, Bullet Man is fun, Pedro singing El Cantante is fun, but you know, a lot of what I do takes stuff from the news and then tells a serious story, but still a story. Uh, just an example off the top of my head, right around the time of Colin Kaepernick and, and you know, talk about race and politics and sports, um, we did a, a piece uh, for uh, only a games uh, show and it was on the Syracuse eight and they were sort of the way we framed it was they were you know college students who had boycotted um, the team at Syracuse and uh, for because of what they perceived as as racial inequities 
and we framed it as, you know, these players were Colin Kaepernick before Colin Kaepernick. So serious and storytelling, and I'd like to think you can be serious and tell stories, and that's a nice little combination. Yeah. I learned my lesson the hard way. <laughs> um, I will not reveal the name of what happened. We, we had this idea to follow a very high level college recruit. Um, he ended up going to a top 25 college program, um, football recruit, uh, spent a day with him, watched him work, and I was checking in with him every three, four you know, months or so. It was, we started in the summer, I sat by every couple of months and talked to the parents and the coaches and you know, had all this great material, and it was as it was um, drawing closer and closer to National Signing Day. Um, we kept the, the responsiveness was less and less, so um, the story never aired. Um, so it's not a question of like the story not panning out. It's sort of like you had this great idea of like really bringing the audience there, and not only bringing them along for the ride in a very short moment, but we wanted to bring them along for the year preceding his commitment to a major college program, and at about the ninth month, it fell through. So that's more my experience with failure. With something like your bullet man before, you know, we do a lot of pre-interviewing in radio, so I got Dennis on the phone, and as soon as I got him on the phone, and, and I could see the way he was sort of, no big deal about getting shot in the head, I was like, oh, this is gonna be an interesting guy to talk to. So a lot of it is pre-interview to make sure you don't fail. I believe so, yes. So in my experience, it, yeah, I was gonna say, well, how long do you have? Um, so in my experience, and to answer your first question, is the storytelling about women, female athletes and women's sports different? Yes, it is different. Um, we use different words, we tend, I mean, I think this is, this is well documented, um, though I think it's changing a bit focus more on appearance with female athletes, use different adjectives, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about um, a male athlete's strength and aggressiveness and praise that, and, and it's not the same with women, and there's a whole sort of almost separate vocabulary that we use in describing women versus male athletes. Some of that's changing because there's more consciousness um, above it, about it, rather, but um, the thing is, it shouldn't be that way. I think that's sort of the answer to your second question, which it is, it's changing, but it shouldn't be that way. And how do we change that? I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot, first of all, it's education, it's awareness, it's just being conscious of it. I think we've simply got to do more of it and we've got to convince, we, sh we shouldn't have to convince, but I think the word is convince, more editors, more people in power that, you know, who are the decision makers, that we need more women's sports coverage and above all, we need more female decision makers in these media outlets, period, full stop there. Any other questions? Can't, it's so hard to see here. Yeah. Oh, microphone is coming. So in continuation of that, how much of that needs to be story building versus storytelling? I guess the thing I, in that context, when we think of, uh, let's just take a superhero movie, if you will. There's the background story movie, and then there's the movie where the Avengers come in together and defeat the big boss, if you will. So origin stories. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I get the superhero thing. <laughs> um, I'm a huge women's sports fan, so I go looking ditto. for the origin story. And that's fantastic. And we need more origin stories, and I think the way we get more origin stories is when we get more consistent coverage. Because when coverage is here and there, or we're just covering a championship series or a big rivalry, you focus on that big rivalry and you don't have time to really dig deep. But if you commit, if news organizations commit to consistent coverage throughout the season, it gives you time to do the origin stories that are so valuable and again, help the audience connect on a deeper level to the athletes and to the game. Any other questions? I know we're kind of out of time. Wow, oh, okay. No, no, any other questions? 
getting them in the El Cantante mode. <laughs> well, I will say this, and, and I was, didn't think this when I started in public radio, but um, bringing an athlete into a studio is very, very helpful. I will say that I did an interview uh, with Pedro the year before at Fenway Park, and we were sitting, um, I think we were sitting in the dugout, um, and it was just sort of, he was in ball player mode, even though he was retired. So I think this is not necessarily a strategy, but in some ways, removing them from the atmosphere um, of, the, of the sport, of being a ball player. Same thing happened with Rich Hill. I, I didn't play the clip or put the clip in, but he started, you know, he, he got emotional, you know, teared up is, is the way we phrased it in the story. Um, I'm not so sure that would have happened uh, if we held the interview at a ballpark. So trying to apply that, if you're stuck in a locker room, perhaps ask questions that take them, you know, that aren't sport focused, that sort of, if they can't, if you can't physically remove them from the locker room, try to mentally put them in a different headspace if possible. That's my pitch. Okay, so I'm getting like bright red flashing lights. I think we're gonna have to call it, but thank you all and I'll stick around if you have questions, more questions.